Welcome everyone to Young at Heart, session number 127. And I'm Father James DeLucio offering you the conclusion of Beauty and the Beast, part the eight, the ultimate segment to bring our story to a close. And so I shall make haste in this Young at Heart segment to get right to the story. Yesterday we left Beauty returning, however very late, from her promised one week visit with her family, returning to the beast, and she, well you shall see what she finds when she returns almost two weeks or more delayed. When Beauty returned to the beast's palace, she put on one of her richest suits, for she wanted to be pleasing to him. And she waited with the utmost impatience for the supper hour. At last, the wished for hour came, the clock struck nine, and yet no beast appeared. Beauty then feared that she had been the cause of the beast's misfortune. Perhaps he had despaired, and she sought everywhere in the castle for him. Until, finally, she recollected the dream that she had about him, and she flew to the canal in the garden. That is where she had seen him in a dream. Well, she found poor Beast stretched out on the lawn, quite senseless, as she had imagined. He seemed to her as if he were dead. She threw herself upon him without any dread, and finding his heart beating still, she fetched some water from the canal and poured it upon him. Beast opened his eyes and said to Beauty, you forgot your promise to me. I was so afflicted, believing I had lost you forever, that I resolved to starve myself in grief. But since I have the happiness of seeing you once more, I shall die satisfied. No, dear beast, said Beauty, you must not die. Live to be my husband, for at this moment I give you my hand, and I swear to be none but yours. Alas, I thought I had only a friendship for you, but this grief that I now feel convinces me that I cannot live without you. Beauty had scarce pronounced these words when she saw the palace sparkle with light, fireworks erupted, instruments of music played magnificent tunes, everything seemed to give notice of some great event. But nothing could take her attention away from the dear beast for whom she trembled with fear. But how great was her surprise, for the beast had disappeared and suddenly she saw, standing at her feet, one of the most handsome princes she had ever laid eyes upon. He returned to her many thanks for having put an end to a charm under which he had so long resembled a beast, though this prince was worthy of all her attention, she could not forbear asking, but where is my beast? You see him at your feet, said the prince. A wicked fairy had condemned me to remain under this shape until a beautiful virgin should consent to marry me. The fairy likewise enjoined me to conceal my understanding of this fact. There was only you in the whole world, generous enough to be won by my goodness of temper. And in offering you my crown, I can't discharge this obligation I have to you, beauty. 
be my queen. Beauty, agreeably surprised, gave the charming prince her hand to rise. And they went together into the castle, and Beauty was overjoyed to find in the great hall her father and her whole family, whom the beautiful lady, the enchantress that had appeared to Beauty in her dream, had conveyed thither. Beauty, said this lady, come and receive the reward of your judicious, judicious choice. You have preferred virtue before either wit or beauty, and deserve to find a person in whom all these qualifications are now united. You are going to be a great queen. I do hope that this throne will not lessen your virtue or make you forget yourself. As to you, ladies, said the fairy to Beauty's two sisters. I know your hearts and all the malice they contain. Become two statues, but under this transformation still retain your reason. You shall stand before your sister's palace gate and be it your punishment to continually behold her happiness and it will not be in your power to return to your former state till you own your faults. But I am very much afraid that you will always remain statues. Pride, anger, gluttony, and idleness are sometimes conquered but the conversion of a malicious and envious mind is a kind of a miracle. Immediately the fairy gave a stroke with her wand, and in a moment all that were in the hall were transported into the prince's dominions. His subjects received him with joy. He married beauty and lived with her for many years, and their happiness as it was founded on virtue was complete. And there we have Beauty and the Beast. Now I hope you were conjuring in your mind your own images of what the beast might look like. The Disney beautiful animated feature and its live action feature notwithstanding. Here's a few pa pictures from my edition. The first is a delightful woodcut of the beast now turned king and beauty, riding off on in married bliss. I think I actually like that one the best. But we also have a very strange looking version of the beast by this particular artist, Eleanor Vera Boyle, 1875. He almost looks like a, a beaver. <laughs> and then we have this one, and she's more looking like a pig. And this one was by Walter Crane, 1874. And then we have these versions of the merchant and the beast also looking a bit more pig-like by Charles Crane. Charles Lamb, sorry. And this one by Laura Richard from 1886. And here's the beast confronting the merchant. I personally like the more wolf-like beasts than the pig-like beasts, but it's a matter of opinion. Okay, well, we're into t almost 10 minutes. 
I was going to offer you some of my notes on variations of the story, but I'll do that tomorrow because we're going to take too long, but I can tell you some of my commentary. The most important one is the fact that aspects of Cinderella, which is a much older story, um, are, have been incorporated into this particular version. So that was very interesting. You certainly caught that with the wicked real sisters, not stepsisters. The other thing, though, that's very important and central to the story is the whole concept of substitution. It is when the merchant steals the rose after all this magnanimity from the beast. It says he has to pun be punished with death. And then he says, well, he'll accept a substitute. If the merchant won't die for his crimes, he won't be fully punished, then he can offer a daughter as a substitute. Now, this substitution theory, if we want to call it that, is as ancient as human civilization. It goes back to ancient Meso Mesopotamia. We find it in the Bible, the whole aspect of offering sacrifices. Tragically, it originated with human sacrifices and then substitutes and the scapegoats, but that's still very much active here in this story. And furthermore, since it comes to us in about the 17th century, uh, again, this version written in the, eight, in the 1700s, or 1800s rather, um, it's very much influenced too by what early and medieval Christian scholars called the, the theology of atonement using that same sense that someone, something had to be substituted to appease the gods. They read Jesus' crucifixion that he had to die to appease God because everything was so out of whack with human sin. All our crimes uh, evidenced in here by the merchant being ungrateful for the bounty of everything by taking this simple but beautiful exquisite rose. Uh, they saw that this is all echoing that sense of atonement that God was so, so miserable with all of our sins, could only forgive us if he had the substitute of his son offering himself completely, which a human being rarely can we do, give our full heart, mind, soul to God. Um, we get caught up in ourselves and in those we particularly love. However, I want to close with saying that that was very much a medieval sensibility in terms of Christian theology, which we also call Christology. We continue to grow and learn and debate, and over the centuries, in the past century, really, um, maybe just slightly shorter, we no longer say this is the, not the definitive way to understand God, Jesus, uh, and the works of God in the, in the, in the world. We're seeing it instead, even though the Bible uses a lot of that um, sacrifice language because that was what was still going on in the biblical times, both prior to and throughout um, Jesus' life and part of the early Christians, which were still part of the temple cult, that today instead we see that God does not demand the substitute. That's a human creation, a human psychology, but instead, offers the kingdom to all, and, uh, but only some will accept it. And in a sense, we find this complete uh, generosity, love, forgiveness on the heart of a God, almost appalling because we know we can never um, fully embrace this kind of true forgiveness, mercy to others. We hold our grudges, we, we, we kiss our wounds, we brood over our bruises. So part of that, and then the threats to changing the status quo, changing, well, this is what we've always done, and this is what our church does, and this is what our, our government does, and this is how it is. Don't try to make us change. Don't bring us deeper into relationship with God. We can't stand it, basically, to sum it up very quickly. And that led, of course, to all the resentment and scapegoating of Jesus. We understand it now that God's plan was first that the people would accept the kingdom, but in refusing it, he offers the only antidote to it, which is forgiveness, even in the midst of suffering, which is what the story of Jesus' passion 
is all about. And through that forgiveness, we are resurrected. The beast in us fades away and we become the person we're really meant to be. So Beauty and the Beast, beautiful story. It's still though very locked in some old ways of thinking, yet it still has the triumph of transformation through love. And in this case, we are given the specifics of virtue, love and virtue and kindness, which can change even the most abominable beast <laughs> back into a prince. So tomorrow we'll do a little more commentary on the character of beauty and we'll hear some of the differences in, from different versions. And uh, so I hope that uh, I've got you pondering um, a bit, yet still holding on to the joy that change is possible. Have a wonderful evening. Bye, everyone.